it seemed at this time all the more probable that the Allies really had the intention of treating for peace, since by forcibly procuring a French negotiator, they had gone to unheard of lengths in order to attribute the first proceedings to the Emperor. And what gave great weight to the belief of the Pacific dispositions of Europe was that there was question, not merely of a continual peace as at Tilsit, and Schoenbrunn, but of a general peace in which England could intervene as a contracting party so that it was hoped that we should gain in security for the results what we might perhaps lose by the severity of the conditions. But unhappily, the hope to which we yielded with anticipated joy was of short duration. We soon learned that the propositions communicated to Monsieur de Saint-Aignan after his abduction were only a lure, an old diplomatic ruse to which the foreigners had resorted in order to lull the emperor with false expectations. A month, in fact, had not elapsed. There had not been time to complete the exchange of preliminary correspondence which takes place in such cases when the emperor learned of the famous declarations of Frankfurt, in which, far from entering into negotiations with his majesty, they affected to separate his cause from that of France. What intrigues! And how one blesses his own mediocrity with all his heart when comparing himself to men condemned to live in this labyrinth of high toned cheating and honorary hypocrisy the miserable certainty was acquired that the foreigners wanted a war of extermination and it renewed consternation where hope was already reigning but the genius of his majesty was not abated and thenceforth all his efforts were directed to the necessity of once more making head against the enemy not now to conquer his provinces, but to guarantee from invasion the sacred soil of the fatherland. Chapter 11. In speaking of the year 1813, mention should not be omitted of the incredible number of affiliations to the sacred societies recently formed in Italy and Germany, which took place that year. The emperor from the time when he was only first consul was not merely not opposed to the reopening of the Masonic Lodges, but it is permissible to think that he covertly favored it. He was very sure that nothing would result from these reunions, which could be dangerous to his person or contrary to his government since Freemasonry counted among its adepts and even had for its chief the greatest personages of the state. Moreover, it would have been utterly impossible that in these societies into which some false brethren insinuated themselves a dangerous secret, had there been such, could have escaped the vigilance of the police. The emperor spoke of them sometimes, but as mere childishness, good to amuse simpletons, and I can affirm that he laughed heartily when he was told that the Arch-Chancellor, in his capacity as Chief of the Grand Orient, did not preside over a Masonic banquet with less gravity than he brought to the Presidency of the Senate and the Council of State. Nevertheless, the unconcern of the Emperor did not extend to the society so well known in Italy under the names Carbonari and in Germany under various denominations. It must, in fact, be admitted that after the attempts of two Germans affiliated to Illuminism, it was very permissible in His Majesty not to see without inquietude the propagation of these Bonds of virtue in which young fanatics were transformed into assassins. I have known nothing special concerning the Carbonari since we were not brought into close relations with Italy. As to the secret societies of Germany, I remember that during our stay in Dresden, I heard a Saxon magistrate with whom I frequently had the honor of being in company talk about him in a manner that interested me greatly. Even while it alarmed me for the future, it was the man of about 60 who spoke French well and in whom German phlegm and the gravity of age were wonderfully blended. In his youth, he had lived in France and had even made a part of his studies at the College of Syriza. I attribute the liking he displayed for me to the pleasure he experienced in hearing a country spoken of whose memory he seemed always to have cherished. 
I remember perfectly even now the profound veneration with which this excellent man spoke to me of one of his former professors of Cerveza, whom he called Dom Ferlos. My memory must have been very ungrateful had I forgotten a name which I heard him repeat so often. My excellent Saxon was called Monsieur Gentz, but he was not related to the diplomat of the same name attached to the Austrian chancery. He was of the reformed religion and very exact in the performance of his religious duties. And I can affirm that I have never known a man more simple in his tastes or more penetrated by his duties as man and magistrate. I would not venture to say what he really thought about the emperor, for he seldom mentioned him. And if he had anything unpleasant to say about him, it may readily be fancied that he would have chosen some other confidant. One day, when we went together to examine the works his majesty was erecting all along the left bank of the Elba, I do not know how the conversation happened to turn on the secret societies of Germany, a subject which I knew absolutely nothing about. As I asked questions for my own information, Mr. Kent said to me, it must not be believed that the secret societies which are multiplying in such an extraordinary way in Germany have been protected by the sovereigns. The Prussian government views are increased with alarm, although at present it is seeking to turn them to account in order to give a national appearance to the war. It is waging on you since the defection of General York. Some of the unions now tolerated have been the object of lively persecutions, even in Prussia. For instance, it is not long since the Prussian government took severe measures for the suppression of the society called Tugend für Rhein, Union of Virtue. It succeeded in breaking it up, but at the very moment of its dissolution, three others were formed from it, which were to be directed by the members of the Tugend für Rhein. Though taking the precaution of disguising themselves under different names, Dr. Jan put himself at the head of the Black Knights, who have since given birth to a body of partisans known as the Black Legion, commanded by Colonel Lutzoff. The memory of the late queen, which is still vivid in Prussia, exercises a great influence over the new direction impressed on its institutions. She might be called their occult divinity. During her lifetime, she gave Baron Nostitz a silver chain, which in his hands became the decoration, or rather the rallying sign, of a new society to which he gave the name the Louisa Union. Finally, Monsieur Lang is the declared chief of an order of concordists, which he has instituted in imitation of the societies of the same name established sometimes since in the universities. My duties as a magistrate, continued Monsieur Gens, have more than once put me in a position to obtain exact information concerning these new institutions. And you may regard what I say on this subject as perfectly authentic. The three chiefs of whom I have just spoken appear to direct three societies, but it is very certain that the three make only one, since these gentlemen are pledged to follow the track of the Tugendverein in every point. They have divided Germany between them, merely to render their influence more immediate by their presence. Monsieur Jan has preserved Prussia, more particularly to himself, Monsieur Lang the North, and Baron Nostitz, the South of Germany. This latter personage, knowing what influence a woman may exert, upon young adepts, has associated with him a very beautiful actress of Prague named Madame Breda, and she has already made a very important conquest for the Louisa Union, and one which may become still more so in the future if the French experience reverses the former elector of Hesse, affiliated through the agency of Madame Breda accepted almost immediately after his reception the Grand Mastership of the Louisa Union. And on the very day of his installation, he placed in the hands of Baron Nostitz the funds necessary for the formation and equipment of a free company of 700 men intended to enter the service of Prussia. It is true that once provided with this sum, the Baron did not trouble himself about the formation of this company in fact. It has been greatly dissatisfied 
the old elector, but by means of address and intrigues, Madame Breda has succeeded in reconciling them. It has, in fact, been demonstrated that Baron Nostitz did not appropriate to his own use the funds with which he was entrusted, but merely gave them another destination than the arming of a free company. Nostitz is, beyond all contradiction, the most zealous, ardent, and able of the three leaders. I do not know him personally, but I know that he is one of the men who are most capable of exerting a great mastery over those who listen to him. It was thus that he captivated Stein, the Pr Prussian minister, to such a point that the latter kept two of his secretaries at the disposal of Baron Nostitz to draw up under his direction the pamphlets with which Germany is inundated. But I cannot too often repeat to you, added Mr. Getz, that the hatred vowed against the French by these different societies is merely an accidental thing born of circumstances only, for their original object was the overthrow of governments as they exist in Germany, and their fundamental principle is the establishment of a system of absolute equality. This is so true that it has been hotly debated among the adepts of the Tugenverein whether or not to proclaim the sovereignty of the people throughout Germany. They say openly that one or ought not to be made in the name of governments, which, according to them, are only instruments. I do not know what will finally result from all these machinations, but it is certain that by dint of assuming importance, the secret societies create one which is not assumed. To listen to them, you would believe that they alone determined the king of Prussia to declare openly against France, and they make a boast of not stopping there, after all. That will probably happen to them, which almost always happens in such cases. If they are considered useful, they will be promised wonders in order to turn them to advantage. And they will be dropped when they are no longer needed. For it is utterly impossible that reasonable governments should lose sight of the real aim of their institution. Such is the sum, which I believe exact. Not of all that Monsieur Gentz told me about the secret societies of Germany, but of all that I remember and I recollect that when I was allowed to give an account of it to the emperor, his majesty deigned to pay great attention and even made me repeat certain details, a fact which contributed not a little towards impressing them on my memory. As to the Carbonari, there is every reason to believe them to be affiliated by secret ramifications to the German societies. But as I have said already, I have not been in a position to obtain certain information concerning them. Nevertheless, I will attempt to reproduce here what I have been told about the reception of the Carbonero. The recital of this history, which is perhaps merely an invention, impressed me greatly. Moreover, I give it here with all reserve, not knowing even whether someone else has not made use of it. Seeing that I was not the only listener to this narration, I had from a Frenchman who lived in the northern part of Italy at the very period from which dates my conversation with Mr. Getz, a French officer formerly attached to General Moreau, a man of an ardent yet somber and melancholy temperament, had left the service after the trial instituted at Paris against his general. He had not been involved in the conspiracy, but being unchangeably attached to Republican principles, simple in his manners, and possessing enough to live on, though in a very modest way, this officer quitted France at the time the empire was founded and took no pains whatever to disguise his aversion for the head of an absolute government. In fine, although very peaceable in his conduct, he was one of those who are styled malcontents. After traveling for some years in Greece, Germany, and Italy, he settled in a small town of the Venetian Tyrol. There he lived in a very retired manner, having few communications with his neighbors, occupied with the study of the natural sciences, and paying no further attention, it might be said, to public affairs. He was in this position, which appeared mysterious to some persons, when the afflictions to the vents or lodges of the Carbonari were making such astonishing progress in the majority of the Italian provinces and notably on the borders of the Adriatic. Several notable inhabitants of the region, Arden Carbonari, conceived the project of enrolling in their society the French officer with whom they were acquainted, as well as with his implacable resentment against the chief of the imperial government, whom he regarded as a great man indeed, but also the destroyer of his dear republic. 
In order to avoid ruffling the presumed susceptibility of the French officer, it was resolved to organize a hunting party, which should direct itself towards the place places where he was accustomed to select for his solitary excursions. This plan was adopted and carried out so that the desired meeting took place and appeared wholly fortuitous. The officer did not hesitate to take part in the conversation of the hunters, several of whom he knew, and after various circumlocutions, the conversation was brought around to the carbonary. Those new adepts of a sacred liberty, that magic word liberty, had not ceased to live in the depths of the officer's hearts. Hence, it produced on him all the effects that could have been expected. It awakened the enthusiastic souvenirs of his youth and made him tremble with long unwanted joy. When, therefore, it was proposed that he should augment the number of brethren by whom he found himself surrounded, he experienced no difficulty. The officer was received. The sacramental signs, the words of recognition were made known to him. His oath was accepted. He pledged himself to be always an all times at the disposal of his brethren and to perish rather than betray their secret thenceforward he was affiliated and continued to live as he had done in the past awaiting a summons at any moment the adventurous character of the inhabitants of the venetian tyrol differs in many respects from that of the inhabitants of italy but it resembles it by a natural suspiciousness which is common to both and among them the descent from suspicion to vengeance is a swift one Hardly had the French officer been admitted to the number of the Carbonari than some among them censured this affiliation and regarded it as dangerous. There were some who even went so far as to say that the mere fact of being a Frenchman should have sufficed to exclude him, and that, moreover, at a time when the police was employing clever men to take all disguises, it was necessary that the firmness and constancy of the newly elected man should be subjected to other trials and the simple formalities to which they had confined themselves. The sponsors of the officer, they who had, so to say, coveted him as a brother, made no objections. So sure were they of the excellence of their choice. Things were at this standpoint when the tidings of the disasters of the French army at Leipzig reached the provinces bordering on the Adriatic and redoubled the zeal of the Carbonari. Nearly three months had elapsed since the reception of the French officer without his having received any notification from his brethren, and he was thinking that the labors of Carbonarism amounted to very little. Then he one day received a mysterious letter in which he was enjoined to repair on the following night, armed with a sword to a wood which was indicated to be there precisely at midnight, and wait until someone should come to seek him. Exact to the rendezvous, the officer repaired thither at the hour prescribed, and remained until daylight without having seen any person appear, whereupon he returned home, supposing that they had merely desired to make trial of his patience. This opinion was changed into conviction when, some days later, another letter having enjoined him to go in the same manner to the same place, he again spent the night in useless waiting. It was not the same with the third and similar appointment. The French officer kept it with the same punctuality and without fatiguing his patience. He had been waiting several hours when all of a sudden, instead of seeing his brethren arrive, he heard the clicking of swords that strike against each other. Carried away by a first impulse, he sprang in the direction whence the noise issued, and it seemed to recede as he advanced. He arrived, nevertheless, at a spot where the frightful crime had been committed. He saw a man bathed in his blood, whom two assassins had just struck down. Quick as lightning, he sprang, sword in hand, upon the two murderers, but they had disappeared into the thick forest and he was about to lavish his assistance on their victim when four gendarmes arrived upon the scene the officer found himself alone with the naked sword in his hand close to the assassinated man the latter who was still breathing made a last effort to speak and expired in the act of designating his defender as his murderer the gendarmes at once arrested him two of them lifted the corpse and the other two bound the officer's arms with cords and led him to a village about a league away, which they reached at daybreak. There he was conducted before the magistrate, interrogated 
executed and committed to prison. Imagine the situation of the officer with no friends in the country afraid to appeal to his own government to which his known opinions would have rendered him suspicious, accused of a horrible crime, seeing every proof against him and moreover crushed beyond escape by the last words of the dying victim. Like all men of firm and resolute character, he looked his position in the face without flinching, saw that it was remediless and resigned himself to his fate. Meanwhile, a special commission had been appointed so as to preserve at least a show of justice. Led before the commission, he could only repeat what he had said to the magistrate who had questioned him at first, that is, to recount the facts as they had occurred, protest his innocence, and yet admit that all the appearances were against him. What could he answer when asked why? With what motive he was alone at night and armed with a sword in the depths of a wood? Here his oath as a carbon narrow impeded his words and his hesitation was but an additional proof against him and what could he reply to the de deposition of the gendarmes who had taken him in the very act hence he was unanimously condemned to death and led back to prison where he was to remain until the day fixed for his execution in the first place a priest was sent to him the officer received him with the greatest respect but abstained from recourse to his ministry next he was importuned by the visit visit of a confraternity of penitents at last the executioners came to lead him to the place of execution as he was going thither accompanied by several gendarmes and between a long and double row of penitents the funereal procession was interrupted by the unexpected appearance of a colonel of gendarmerie whom chance had brought to the scene of action this superior officer bore the name of colonel boisard a name well known throughout Upper Italy and dreaded by all malefactors, the colonel ordered a suspension of proceedings that he might interrogate the condemned in person and learn the circumstances of the crime and the trial. When he was alone with the officer, he said to him, you see that everything is against you and that nothing can rescue you from death. Still, I can save you, but on one condition, I know that you are affiliated to the sect of the carbonary tell me who are your accomplices in these underhand machinations and you may have your life at that price never but consider never i tell you have me taken to the place of execution hence the road to the scaffold had to be resumed the executioner was at his post the officer mounted with a firm step the fatal ladder colonel boisart sprang toward him and again begged him to save his life in the condition he had named no no never then the scene changed the colonel the executioners the gendarmes the priests the penitents the spectators all crowded around the officer everybody wanted to embrace him at last he was led in triumph to his dwelling all that had happened was merely a reception the assassins of the forest and their victim as well as the judges and the pretended colonel boisard had been playing their part and the most suspicious of the carbonary knew to what point their newly affiliated brother could push the heroism of constancy and the sacredness of an oath. Such is very nearly the story to which I listened, as I have said with the keenest interest, and I have thought I might be permitted to recall it here, yet without concealing from myself how much it must lose in being written down. Should it be accepted without reserve, that is what I dare not decide. But what I can certify is that the narrator said that it was true and even declared that the details of it would be found in the archives of Milan, seeing that this extraordinary reception had been made at the time the object of a circumstantial report addressed to the viceroy, whom fate had already condemned, never to see the emperor again. Chapter 12. I wandered somewhat. In the preceding chapter, from my reminiscences of Paris, subsequently to our return from Germany after the Battle of Leipzig, and the Emperor's short sojourn at Mans. Even today, I cannot write the name of the latter city without recalling the spectacle of tumult and confusion it presented after the glorious break at Hanau where the Bavarians were so roundly beaten the first time that they presented themselves as enemies in a serious affair to those in which ranks they had previously combated. If I do not mistake, it was in that battle that the Bavarian General Vreda and even his family became the immediate victims of their treason. The general whom the emperor had loaded with 
favors, was mortally wounded. All the relatives he had in the Bavarian army were slain. And his son-in-law, Prince Utingen, experienced the same fate. This was one of those events which seldom failed to make an impression on His Majesty's mind because they chimed in with his fatalistic notions. It was likewise from Mayence that the emperor issued a decree for the assembly of the legislative body on December 2. But as we shall see, this opening was delayed and would to God that it had been indefinitely adjourned for then his majesty would not have experienced the tribulations caused him later on by the symptoms of opposition which manifested themselves for the first time and in a manner which was at least unseasonable. One of the things which astonished me most and which astonishes me still more when I think of it now was the inconceivable activity of the emperor far from diminishing. It seemed daily to take a new extension as if the very exercise of his forces had redoubled them. I could not give an idea of the manner in which his majesty's time was occupied at the period of which I am writing. Besides, since he had once more seen the empress and his son, the emperor had regained his serenity. I no longer surprised in him, or at least but rarely, those external signs of depression, which he had not always concealed in private life after our return from Moscow. He occupied himself still more ostensibly than usual in the numerous works he was having executed in Paris. This was a salutary Diver diversion from his grand ideas of war and the afflicting news he was re receiving from the army. Nearly every day troops equipped as by enchantment were reviewed by his majesty and sent immediately to the Rhine, nearly the whole line of which was threatened. The danger of which we scarcely dreamed must then have seemed imminent to the inhabitants of the capital who were not carried away as we were by the sort of charm exerted by the emperor over all who had the honor of approaching his august person. It was at this period that for the first time we saw the Senate asked for a contingent of men not due until the following year and moreover each day brought disagreeable tidings thus during the autumn we witnessed the return of the prince arch treasurer who had been forced to leave holland after the evacuation of that kingdom by our troops while marshal cuvion sancier was forced to sign a capitulation at dresden for himself and the thirty thousand men whom he had retained to that city the capitulation of Marshal Sancier will assuredly not occupy an honorable place in the history of the cabinet of Vienna. It is not my business to criticize political combinations, but I cannot forget the indignation manifested by everybody in the palace when it was learned that this capitulation had been outrageously violated by those who had become the strongest. The capitulation provided that the marshal should return to France with the troops under his command, bringing a part of his artillery, that these troops might be exchanged against an equal number of those of the Allied powers, that the sick Frenchmen remaining in Dresden should be forwarded to France as fast as they recovered, and that in fine the marshal should begin his march November 16th. Nothing of the sort occurred. Fancy that the indignation of the emperor already so profoundly afflicted by the capitulation of Dresden when he learned that in defiance of all the stipulated agreements, his troops had been made prisoners by Prince Schwarzenberg. I remember that I was in his majesty's cabinet one day when Prince de Neuchatel was there and that the emperor said to him angrily, you talk to me about peace? Eh, if, how do you suppose that I can believe in the good faith of those people? See what has happened at Dresden? No, I tell you. They don't want to treat. They are only trying to gain time. It is our business not to lose any. The prince made no answer, or at least I did not hear his response. For I left the cabinet then, having executed the order that had called me there. Moreover, I can add, as a further proof of the confidence with which His Majesty did to honor me, that he never interrupted what he was saying on my entrance, no matter how important it might be, and I dare affirm that if my memory were better, these souvenirs would be far more valuable than they are, since I have spoken of the bad tidings which assailed the emperor almost uninterruptedly during the latter months of 1813. There is one which I must not omit to mention because it affected his majesty so painfully. I refer to the death of the Count Louis de Norbonne. Of all the persons who had not begun their career under the eye of the emperor, Mr. de Norbonne was probably the one 
whom he most liked. And it must be owned that it would be impossible to combine real merit with more attractive manners. The emperor considered him the most suitable person to conduct a negotiation successfully. Narbonne is a born ambassador, he said of him one day. It was known in the palace why the emperor had appointed him his aide-de-camp at the time when he was forming the household of the Empress Marie Louise. It had been at first the emperor's intention to make him knight of honor to the new empress, but a cleverly contrived intrigue induced the latter to refuse him, and it was as a sort of indemnity for this that he received the appointment of aide-de-camp of his majesty. At that time, there was not one in France which was more highly esteemed. Many foreign princes and even sovereigns vainly solicited this high favor among these I can. A deuce, Prince Leopold of Saxe Coburg, the husband of the Princess Charlotte of England, who refused to be King of Greece after having failed to become the Emperor's aide de camp. I would not venture to say, after carefully consulting my memory, that nobody at court was jealous at seeing Monsieur de Narbonne as an aide-de-camp of the emperor, but I forget the names. However that might be, he soon became a favorite, and the emperor daily appreciated more highly his qualities and services. Concerning this, I recollect hearing his majesty say, and I think it was at Dresden, that he had never well understood the cabinet of Vienna until Narbonne's sharp nose, these are his own expressions, had smelled out its old diplat. <laughs> oh my goodness diplomatists after the pretense at negotiations of which I have spoken already and which occupied the whole time of the armistice of 1813 at Dresden Monsieur de had resided in Germany where the emperor had confided to him the government of Torgau it was there he died November 17 in consequence of a fall from his horse in spite of the skillful attentions lavished on him by Baron de Genetz. since the death of Marshal de Rock and that of Prince Ponitovsky, I do not recollect having seen the emperor display more regret than on this occurrence. Meanwhile, almost at the time when he lost Monsieur de Narbonne, but before hearing of his death, the emperor had provided a substitute near his person in the man whom he had loved most, not excepting General Desai. He had just summoned General Bertrand to the high functions of Grand Marshal of the Palace, and this choice was generally approved by all those who had the honor of knowing Count Bertrand. But what can I have to say here of a man whose name history will never separate from that of the emperor? The same period has seen the death of the Duke District, one of the four colonel generals of the guard, and of Marshal de Rock. The same nomination united the names of their successors. Marshal Suchet was appointed at the same time as General Bertrand and replaced Marshal Bessier as colonel general of the guard. At this period, His Majesty made several other changes in the personnel of the superior administration of the empire, a decree of the Senate having conferred on the emperor the right to select the president of the court legislative. His Majesty appointed the Duke de Massa to that post, replacing him in his functions as chief justice by Count Mole, the youngest minister the emperor ever had. The Duc de Bassano resumed the secretaryship of state, and the Duke de Vicenza received the portfolio of foreign relations. I have said that during the autumn of 1813, His Majesty went several times to visit the public works. He generally went on foot and almost alone to see those of the Tuileries and the Louvre. Afterwards, he would mount a horse accompanied by at most one or two of his officers and Mr. Fontaine to examine those which were more distant. One day, nearly at the end of November, having profited by his majesty's absence to take a few turns in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, I unexpectedly found myself near him at the moment when he reached the entrance of Rue de Tournon. On his return from the Luxembourg, I cannot describe with what lively satisfaction I heard the shouts of love of the emperor as he approached. I was thrust very near the emperor's horse by the pressure of the crowd. I did not suppose, however, that his majesty had recognized me. I had proof to the contrary on his return. The emperor had seen me. And as I was assisting him to change his garments, he said to me cheerfully, Well, Monsieur Ledrault, and what were you doing in the Faubourg Saint-Germain? I see what it is. That is very fine. You go to spy upon me when I go out. 
and many other speeches of the same sort, for on that day the emperor was very gay, whence I inferred that he had been satisfied with his visit. When at this period the emperor experienced any anxieties, I thought I noticed that he liked to dispel them by showing himself in public, perhaps more frequently than during his other sojourns in Paris, yet always with that affectation. He even went several times to the play, and thanks to the kindly attentions of the Count de Rimesa, I was very often present at those assemblies, which on such occasions always had a very festive appearance, certainly on the day of the first representation of the ballet of Nina at the opera. It would have been difficult to suppose when their majesties entered their box that the emperor already counted enemies among his subjects. It is true that the mothers and wives in mourning were not there, but what I can affirm is that I have never seen more enthusiasm. The emperor enjoyed it this time from the bottom of his heart, more perhaps than after his victories. The idea of being loved by the French people made the most vivid impression on him. In the evening, he spoke of it. Shall I dare to say that he talked about it to me like a child who prides himself on the reward he has just received? Then, with all the simplicity of a private man, he often repeated, my wife, my good Louise, she must have been well satisfied. The fact is, that there was such eagerness in Paris to see the emperor at the play that, as he always occupied the side box, looking on the front of the stage, whenever it was supposed that he would be present, the boxes on the other side of the theater were taken with the utmost promptness. Even the highest tier of boxes was preferred to the best ones on that side of the theater, whence it was most difficult to see him. No one who lived in Paris at that time can fail to recognize the exactness of these souvenirs. Not long after the first representation of the ballet of Nina, the emperor was present at yet another performance, which I also witnessed. As on the previous occasion, he was accompanied by the empress, and during the representation, I could not escape the thought that possibly the emperor experienced certain souvenirs capable of distracting his attention from the harmony of the music. It was at the Italian theater, then located at the Odeon, Nazzolini's Cleopatra was given, and the performance was one of those that are styled extraordinary because it was for the benefit of Madame Grassini. It was within a very short time that this singer celebrated on so many accounts had first shown herself in public upon a Parisian stage. In fact, I think that on this day she appeared for the third or fourth time at most. And to be exact, I must say that she did not produce on the Parisian public all the effect that was expected from her immense reputation. It was a long time since the emperor had received her more privately. And yet, until then, the tones of her voice and that of Crescentini had been reserved for the privileged ears of the spectators of St. Cloud or of the Tuileries Theater. On this occasion, the emperor was very generous to the beneficiary, but there was no interview because, as was said by a poet at the time, that Cleopatra Paris had not to do with another Antony. Thus, as one sees, the emperor stole a few evenings from the vast affairs which occupied him less for the sake of enjoying the play than to show himself in public. All the useful establishments were the object of his cares. He did not even rely solely upon the information furnished by men who justly enjoyed his confidence, but he examined everything himself. Among the establishments especially protected by his majesty was one which he particularly liked. I do not believe that the emperor ever came to Paris in the intervals between one war and another without paying a visit to the establishment of the demoiselles of the Legion of Honor under the direction of Madame Capin at Ecouen in the first place and afterwards at Saint-Denis. The emperor went there in the month of November, and I recall an anecdote concerning his visits, which I heard the emperor relate and which greatly diverted him. I cannot be sure, however, whether it belongs to the visit of 1813 or to a previous one. It must be known to begin with that, conformably with the regulations of the house and the demoiselles of the Legion of Honor, no man except the emperor was admitted to the interior of the establishment. But as the emperor always went there with some display, his suite was considered as part of himself and entered with him. In addition to his officers, two pages usually attended him. Now it happened in the evening after returning from Saint-Denis, the emperor said to me with a laugh on entering his chamber where I was waiting to address him. Well, well, 
Here are my pages trying to resemble the ancient pages, the little rogues. Do you know what they do? When I go to Saint-Denis, they wrangle with each other as to who shall go with me. Ah! Ah! As he spoke, the emperor was laughing and rubbing his hands. Then after repeating, the little rogues, in the same tone a number of times, he added, as a consequence from one of those singular reflections which occurred to him now and then, Constant. I would have been a very poor page. Such an idea would never have come into my head. However, they are good young fellows. Fine officers have come from them already. Marriages will be the result some day. It was seldom, in fact, that an apparently frivolous manner did not elicit a serious conclusion on the part of the emperor to me, also barring some recollections of the past. There now remain none but serious things and often very sad ones to relate. For here we are at a point where all assumes a grave appearance and is infested with colors that are very often somber. Chapter 13. For the last time, the anniversary of His Majesty's coronation was celebrated in Paris. The gifts of the emperor on this occasion were the innumerable addresses he received from all the cities of the empire and in which offered sacrifices and protestations of loyalty, seemed to augment with the increasing difficulties of the situation. Alas, four months were enough to demonstrate the value of these protestations, and yet how in this unanimous agreement could one fail to believe in a not less complete unanimity of unreserved?